Lindsay Allen is a senior lecturer in Greek and Near Eastern history at King's College London. She's interested primarily in the Achaemenid Persian Empire and pre-Islamic Iran. Her work explores the text and material culture of Achaemenid kingship and the history of scholarship and reception, particularly in relation to Persian history, the ancient Near East, and Alexander of Macedon. Her most recent publication explores the reception of pre-Islamic culture, specifically Persepolin reliefs in 17th century Iran. She is currently working on a catalog of stone fragments from Persepolis removed from the site since 1700. And we'll be hearing a little bit more about that today. So welcome, Dr. Allen. Thank you. OK, uh, so today I want to pick up on really many of the themes evoked from this morning's conversations and um, with Maury Kessel's keynote yesterday, and talk about the mobile and mutable value of a series of fragments of stone from Iran that came to the City Museum of Cincinnati, uh, the Cincinnati Art Museum. Um, CAM, if, can I, is CAM an abbreviation that guy, you guys use? Okay, CAM acquired these uh, three pieces, which also present, uh, represent the parts of three human figures, um, originating in the site of Persepolis um, between 1951 and 1961. They had been purchased from the market by either the museum or their donors, Philip Adams and Jack Emery, between 1947 and 1955, so a relatively quick handover there. The era of acquisition and the association with Adams and Emery placed these acquisitions at the heart of the two's ambitious project to transform the CAM in the post-war period. I need to reach that. Um, before I take you back to the source of the fragments that I'm talking about, I want to start with that transformative period and at the same time acknowledge the many years of collaborative assistance I've received in Cincinnati while researching this collection, both before and after a Titus Fellowship at UC in 2014. Many years ago now, <laughs> I received the first provenance information about these three fragments from the late Glenn Marco who readily provided the information he had had available about the donors and dates of purchase. Since then, I've been assisted by um, numerous um, members of staff at the Museum Library and Archives, um, and also over at UC, actually tried to um, list a few people here. Um, it's over the years, it's been everybody from the current um, team um, back to um, Amy Dahan, uh, Cynthia uh, Emnius, who I think I've spotted, uh, Lisa DeLong, uh, Jennifer Pettigrew, and more people, lots more people. Um, and in particular, Jack Davis, Kathleen Lynch, and Anne Santon offered a lot of support and advice at UC, and uh, one of the pieces of information I'm going to be showing you now was provided to me by uh, Anne Santon, so thanks so much for that. Um, so the exchanges we've, exchanges we've had over the years about this collection and more recently have really just been a delight and a huge encouragement um, that this work is worthwhile and welcomed in um, this forward-looking museum. So I'll try and take a streamlined journey through three, four, three to four stages of information in today's talk. I've borrowed um, the, the quote from uh, Cameron Kitchen yesterday, radical transformation, um, to stand in for Adams and Emery's uh, phase of innovation at the museum in the post-war period. Then I want to look at the restoration required in the same period at the originating site of Persepolis, and the way in which the fragmentation exhibited here in the pieces at the site in Cincinnati relate to the significant gaps left at the site by the, by the mid-20th century. The extraction and acquisition phase is all about the ambitions of the museums acquiring these objects and how they relate to effects on the, uh, on the site. And that also links in, I think, um, very well, I think, with uh, Morag's paper yesterday about the demand created, uh, which um, kind of on the market, which uh, directly affects uh, um, the survival, the physical integrity of sites. So I want to close with a, an outline of the lost context for these fragments and the continued relevance of those contexts for the study and existence today in this collection. So 
So as I mentioned yesterday, um, Cameron Kitchen repeatedly involved, evoked the phrase radical transformation to describe the ongoing innovations here. In a 1971 feature in the Cincinnati Enquirer, thanks Anne, <laughs> Owen Vinson described how Adams and Emery had similarly transformed the City Museum in the last 20 years. Um, and part of the description uh, I just want to quote here. The old entrance to the museum is hidden now by the new Adams Emery wing. Originally, the museum faced Eden Park Drive and its entrance opened onto a wooden shelter house at the trolley stop. Orange streetcars were the primary means of getting to the museum, climbing the Mount Adams incline and rattling incongruously through the woods of Eden Park. It is a sign of the times that the present entrance to the museum is at the back of the building and faces the parking lot. I think that's a positive feature for 1971, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, oops. Okay. Um, the interview primarily focused on Adam's three decades of investment in the museum's sculpture collection. Uh, Vincent evokes the Museum of the Past, where the gallery was crowded with plaster and bronze copies of the most famous Greek and Roman works. And Adam's response to that was to say, uh, of course, we had practically no original sculptures at all in the museum. The first thing we did in 1945 and 46 was to acquire a great many of these sculptures as the basis of the larger collection we now have. So Adams eliminated the plaster casts, discarded all of um, armor pieces that were copies. Uh, you see, he said, if they had a real visor or breastplate, they used to manufacture a whole suit of armor to go with it. We don't have much on display anymore, but it's all authentic. Um, and as context for this, I'm showing you the authentic details of the 1961 Persepolis relief in the gallery. So Adams's vision was the elimination of the inauthentic and its replacement with the authentic. Uh, no reconstructions or completions here, but only the pure substance of the past, as fragmentary as it must appear. The gaps that Adams and Emery were instead trying to fill were the perceived voids in the story of the museum must tell, represented by authentic samples of different periods of art. He said, we tried in cold blood. Um, yes, it gets worse, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, we tried in cold blood to get sculpture because the museum had so little of it. Um, first the important sculpture, then the arts that were being ignored by other museums. Then Adams began to fill the gaps in other parts of the collection. This is Finson paraphrasing Adams. So the ancient Iranian relief sculptures were part of this program, showing the fuller spectrum of art history around the core scaffolding, as it were, embedded first by Adams and Emery. As you can see, he said, um, once we had an outline, we began fleshing it out as much as possible. Our Near Eastern collections are more interesting artistically because so me few museums have them. That was the second phase of our deliberate collecting because we gave some thought to what great art was being temporarily neglected. This was perhaps, oops, this was perhaps um, the best known um, of our collections outside Cincinnati because it kept pace with scholars' knowledge, which is an interesting um, uh, proclamation. Um, this focus um, by Alan Adams and Emery on their Near Eastern collection is not something I have time to fully address today, but it's worth noting that they conceived of their take on the Near East as heavily Persianate, that is, heavily in and around the cultures of Iran and uh, related neighboring countries, um, and also running the full chronological range between antiquity and the 17th century there and thereabouts. And I show you as a, as a kind of illustration of that, the old, um, uh, one of the older installations from 2013 of the gallery showing the sort of pre-Islamic, as it were, material all the way through to the Islamic as a, as a vision um, uh, instilled in the collection by Adams and Emery. Um, Adams reflected on the historical specificity, specificity of the collecting he led as follows. Um, and he says, he does not believe that any museum could undertake such a project again. The art objects are too rare now, now and their prices are too high. Collecting was done before other countries became concerned with their own art, not quite true. Um, in most cases, it is legal to take art out objects out of a country to bring to the United States. In some cases, museums are even being forced to return objects to the countries they came from. Shock horror. Um, things go in cycles, and this just happened to be one of those periods when collections grew enormously. 
And there was a change in state of mind from the age of plasticast to the age of sculpture originals, which I was lucky to be in on that. So these quotes amplify the museum's achievement and burnish the cultural as well as the financial valuation of its collection. They also betray Adams's thorough absorption by, I would say, an acculturation in the psychology of the art market in the United States of the mid-century, where objects detached from their often old world context, but not exclusively, by several removes, uh, were introduced to buyers by competitive dealers who strove to build their clientele. In 1971, Adams believed he was looking back at a closed era of availability, a perception that might me feel, feel funny now <laughs> um, in the light of new collections that have come since, uh, but in, in this, uh, at this point in which collections could be built only for the sake of the visions they conjured in their new homes. So they're really pure thoughts and uh, leading to collection in their, in their new locality. The world of competition for art served by dealers is summarized in a quote also very much of its era offered by Adams about a different relief in the classical collection, uh, which has, I guess, an, a distant indirect connection to Persia. On the Mithraic relief, um, over on show now, this is a photo from yesterday, he said, while it is a well-known subject in European museums, there is only one other and a fragment of a third in this country. We think this one is the finest. This came from a New York dealer. It is said to have come from Italy. We don't want to know the circumstances. <laughs> so today, I will be talking partly about those circumstances in the history of the Persepolis fragment and reflecting on what additional depth it brings to the encounter between them and the modern Ohio metropolis. And in doing so, I'm really indebted to Ainsley and the museum leadership and community for providing a space in which we can explore this. And I hope I get through it. Um, so in the year that the Cincinnati Museum celebrated its silver anniversary, the Persian monarchy in the shape of Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, the second of the self-proclaimed early to mid 20th century dynasty in Iran, um, that Persian monarchy celebrated its 2,500th year uh, with an extravagant celebration at the ancient capital of Persepolis, of which you see a couple of press photos here, and I'm admitting the uh, British uh, involvement by giving you a flash of Prince Philip there. Um, less visibly but more impactful, impactfully for the site, 1971 marked the midpoint in a years-long collaborative restoration of its fragmentary stone stru structures under the direction of the husband and wife team Giuseppe and Anne Brittilia. An Iranian-Italian team excavated hundreds of small fragments that had been discarded in the process of an eight-year-long excavation by the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute 30 years previously. They isolated and conserved slabs that compri comprised the outer foundational skin of multiple columned halls. I'm gradually revealing more and more of the site as I go on. They rebuilt columns. They restored stone doorways back to their original position in elevated royal halls. Notably, though, they installed recut blanks of stone inside gaps which had been left in the structure by previous episodes of looting so that facades could become more complete and durable without the return of those excised pieces. And I do just want to note that as part of that project, Ambritelia drew up the first list of fragments in foreign museums as part of that project, seemingly to direct support, directly support it. Uh, so that she knew what was not coming back that needed to be filled, is what I su suspect she was doing. So I show you here a facade that we need to know more about, because this is an original, the original site of our Cincinnati Guard, the largest piece in the gallery, donated by Emery in 1961. And you can see here two phases of restoration of a rank of guards, all of whose upper halves have been removed, and only one damaged survivor was recovered from the ground in front of this facade. This restoration uh, project continued until the revolution and with some periods of very straightened circumstances, extensive conservation continues today. Um, and on my first solo visit to the site in 1991, I found a stone conservation team working on the Palace of Xerxes, which is this palace here. Um, and a new multinational conservation team has worked specifically on stone surface conservation at the site since 2019. Um, so the Telias were not tackling natural decay in the ruins. Um, they were mitigating the effects of a few concentrated episodes of looting that significantly affected the fabric of the ruins, uh, particularly in the 20th century. 
And here I will give it to you straight. The Persepolis fragments arrived in Cincinnati after the completion of the excavations at the site by the Oriental Institute Chicago, but they did not originate in those excavations. Um, they were not considered they were not part of what was considered at the time legitimate partage, and on the right I've just given you a glimpse of archival documentation relating to that partage uh, from 1933 to 34 with, with the Oriental Institute Chicago. But on the left, you see testimony of, from two excerpts um, of, from letters exchanged between Chicago and Persepolis in 31 and 32, as the Oriental Institute tried to work out why fragments were appearing on the market at the same time as their excavations were ongoing. The secretary of the Institute wrote to the excavator Hertzfeldt, Stora is a firm which has been offering for sale quantities of Luriston bronzes and other Persian antiquities. I might add that Pope, he means Arthur Ruppen Pope, has been in the closest touch with them and undoubtedly furnishes them with much of this stuff. Hertzfeld replied in January 32 from Persepolis, the sculptures have been stolen from Persepolis and belong to one of the sculptures staircases, actually multiple staircases. According to some investigations, the stones have been taken away a year or a year and a half ago by a dealer called Rabineau, great friend of Mr. AUP, and have been exported by the latter. So Arthur Upham Pope was an American art historical entrepreneur who took the opportunity of the coincidence of the beginning of the Oriental Institute excavations and the publicity of an international exhibition of Persian art at Burlington House in London to market many items of Iranian art, including Persepolis fragments. Um, two museums at that time. In the partage, then, this is just a glimpse of that um, display in 1931. I will briefly re return to it again. In the partage, um, then, the excavator of the time, Ernst Hertzfeld, made a selection of fragments based on an awareness of what had just been taken from the ruins, which he knew about, um, and few pieces of the Oriental Institute partage collection now parallel what's in other US museums because of that consciousness. Um, so I'm just giving you a, a, a vision here of the Oriental Institute gallery with the um, material excavated from Persepolis in the 1930s. Our available, just to go on, our available photographic evidence suggests that Hertzfeld's chronology of the looting was correct. His own survey photographs from the 1920s show a row of guards still on display. On the left of the left-hand photograph here, um, you can see those guards still surviving. Uh, just, just sort of peeking in on the left edge there. And then in the winter of 1929 to 1930, a young Japanese art historian, Arata Wada, or otherwise known as Wada Shin, uh, took photographs of some of the visible sculptures across the site. They show also these guards and a number of other later extracted reliefs still in situ in January 1930. Um, so this slide just following is showing you Hertzfeld's photograph on the left and the condition of the facade after looting, then excavation, and then part restoration in the 1970s. And you can see that this whole, um, uh, this whole bank of guards have gone here, from here. These were all still there, and I will show you more of them later. Um, so by January 1931, those uh, several tons of carved reliefs were gone. Um, the first of them had arrived on the Parisian art market by December 1930, so really quick work. And they continued to be sold from showrooms in Paris and New York between 1931 and as late as the 1950s. Um, and I show you a couple of examples. Um, this is a detail from Wadashin's, another photograph from 1930, and the stock of Stora in the 1930s. And it's a bit blurry, I'm sorry, uh, but what you're seeing here is a piece now in Seattle which is visible here, and a piece now in Baltimore, which is visible here, and were this a bit sharper, you'd be able to see um, the comparable damage and format there. Um, so, yes, slightly more detailed. If you want to see later, I can show you more. Uh, the other pieces are in um, Harvard and the Louvre. So, some of those first fragments were put on display in the 1931 exhibition, and it's likely that Pope and his collaborators deliberately aimed to coincide with this international shop front and stimulation of the market. Um, and they also had to beat the deadline of a new cultural heritage law introduced in Iran in 1930, um, by which point the fragments were probably already on a ship. 
Um, so where do they come from? And this is where I try and do this as fast as possible. Um, showing you the view on the left of the plan of Persepolis, um, as excavated by the Oriental Institute and the Iranian Archaeological Service, um, British diplomats and European visitors had plundered reliefs in the 19th century from the northern part of the terrace, over here, mostly. And by uh, the early 20th century, people were searching for a sort of novelty, a more a no novel sort of section, a novel class of, 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 of uh, material. And so they ventured further down into these parts of these unexplored parts of the uh, site in, in, sort of in looting terms and started to explore this region here. So this is the Palace of Darius here, the Palace of Xerxes here, and there's a sort of courtyard formed by the uh, conjunction of them. And this is where our looters had a little stroll from about here all the way around the staircases and just basically dug where they could in this accessible bay um, created by the um, excavations. Um, did Cincinnati buy the first pieces that no other, universe, uh, no other museums were covering? Not quite. Um, this is merely a pattern to show you um, where the first acquisitions were made, which were a number of um, private buyers, plus Boston, Detroit, Kansas, Yale, New York, uh, Baltimore, this is the City Museum, not Walters, Seattle, etc. And um, Ohio comes a little bit later in that phase, and here are our Cincinnati uh, pieces here, um, then donated to the museum. So what happened with the collecting and buying pattern, sorry, was that there was an initial influencer stage centered around the institution of Harvard, more or less, um, and then a sort of a Midwest phase of dissemination outwards. So from the earliest uh, parts of the dissemination, this is a piece bought for Boston Museum of Fine Arts by Arthur Upham Pope in 1931, in spring 1931, and it is from the other side of the um, same slab that the Cincinnati piece um, comes from which is here. So we are on the south stairs of the Palace of Darius, and this is a photograph you, might, you guys might be familiar with of me showing the uh, um, corner of the south stairs here as the location for the Cincinnati stairway figure, who would have been in a series of figures moving upwards. Here his neighbor has been mutilated, um, and he would have stepped onto this step here um, and had somebody else behind him. So this is a collective um, sort of three-dimensional space um, in which um, he comes from and his neighbor is currently in Germany um, here. So you can see a whole series. And this kind of is quite extensive. This slab, which I've just shown you the inside of to show you the location of the Cincinnati piece, um, itself was disseminated and became a whole series of museum artifacts um, and has been yeah, fully disseminated and fully kind of um, un, yeah, unarticulated. Um, the same thing happened to the neighboring and larger staircase of the Palace of, De of Xerxes. And this is, I will try and um, condense this because I'm going to run out of time. It's the west facade here. And one of the things I did want to mention about the Palace of Xerxes is that everything is twice, twice the size, twice the inscriptions. So there was a sort of notion of generational succession in the development of the um, structures at Persepolis, which I find interestingly paralleled in the development of the city museum um, in its remote location. And here again, you can see um, these guards in situ in uh, the 1870s and published in 1880. And here is the Cincinnati guard and his neighbors who are in Boston, uh, Harvard, Cambridge, Harvard, and um, uh, New York, um, and uh, sorry, in Cleveland. Um, and here is the neighbor who was restored as a sort of mutilated survivor by the Teliers in the 70s. So that was the market demand directly served. I'm going to skip over <laughs> the question of where the third piece is from, but he seems also to be from the Palace of Xerxes, and his neighbor may have originally been the Dayton fragment um, that we are looking into, I think, in an ongoing way. 
And I think what I just want to show you here is the way in which these pieces all evoke a space, an original space in the site of Persepolis um, in which the Palace of Darius liaises with its, his successor, the Palace of, um, the Palace of Xerxes. Um, and the disarticulation of these pieces really removed them from this chronological and dynastic arrangement and the fact that they, in fact, were about solidifying a sort of social group or a set of social groups at the head of a large empire. I want to finish now uh, with a couple of evocations. One is to contrast um, the sort of exotic hall of treasures that the um, gallery used to represent, uh, which I have a fondness for because of its sort of um, spread through um, time, um, and to contrast that with the kind of bright light of truth that I feel like you're bringing uh, to the articulation of the collection um, in its new presentation. And um, finally, something I haven't um, shown you enough of, um, the site and its living social, socially kind of generative, energetic form as it is today. These are immediate shots um, from um, the Nowruz period, which is the site's busiest period in Iran, um, when everybody piles in to go and visit uh, Persepolis. You have um, a guide giving um, an uh, introduction to the reliefs um, at the upper diner, then one of the main halls here. You have a crowd in front of the um, uh, site museum here, and you have a performance in front of one of the main public, as it were, open areas um, here on the northern end of the terrace. So this is a lively and inhabited, as it were, site. Uh, and I will close with the view of the grand entrance. Thank you very much. <laughs>